I'm Tim Ventura, and we're joined today by Dr. Jack Sarfati, a theoretical physicist specializing in advanced propulsion research. Dr. Sarfati has a PhD in physics from the University of California, taught physics at San Diego State University, worked with David Bohm at the University of London's Burbeck College, and with Abdul Salam at the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Trieste, Italy. Jack was the basis of the memorable time-traveling Dr. Emmett Brown in the Back to the Future trilogy, and the author of Super Cosmos, Destiny Matrix, Space Time and Beyond 2, and the co-author with Fred Allen Wolf and Bob Tobin of Space Time and Beyond toward an explanation of the unexplainable. Today, Dr. Sarfati will discuss wormholes, warp drives, and conceptual approaches for advanced propulsion supported by well-accepted models of relativistic physics, and how these may offer insights into the UAP phenomena. Let me start out with an oddball question. Okay, okay. so yeah. wormholes and quantum entanglement, right? Yes. They, they are the same thing, or they're related. They're related. They're not the same thing. <clears throat> They're related. The nature of the relationship is the holographic principle. Okay, this is this is now Lenny Seskind. Now, the important thing to note <clears throat> is that um, this is kind of important. This is uh, we're gonna the high strangeness aspect of this whole phenomenon that we're involved with. Lenny Seskind and I first met at Cornell University in 1963. Okay, with this other guy, Johnny Glogauer, who's a, who was this uh, genius kid. He was a child prodigy that I went to uh, grammar school, actually middle school with, and then also high school. And Johnny was also part of the Columbia University Super Kids Project with me and other guys like Bob Solovey and even <clears throat> Milton Friedman, Aaron Milton Friedman, mm, you know, the okay. guy was part of it, but he was older. He was like in a different part. So, so the thing is that, um, so Lenny had just come to Cornell from City College in New York, where he had been an undergraduate, but he was also kind of a, you know, maverick genius. He, he didn't pass any of his, liberal arts courses, but he got, you know, like perfect scores in math and physics, okay? <clears throat> so Lenny actually never got his bachelor's degree from CCNY, but um, Cornell, you know, Phil Morrison and Beta, all these guys from the Manhattan Project, they were identifying, you know, genius people. So they right away invited Lenny to be a graduate student, even though he didn't have any regular degree. And so Lenny, and then when Lenny arrived, he his father's a plumber. He was a plumber. He worked as a plumber. You know, like Einstein said, he, if, he, if he could do it all over again, Einstein would be a plumber. Lenny actually was a plumber. Okay. I worked in his father's business. And when he came to Cornell, he was dressed like a plumber. He was wearing, you know, his Levi, these, uh, you know, what they wear, the Levi's where the straps come way up. You know, he looked, he looked like a plumber. What <laughs> did they, 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 they chat it on? <laughs> you know, so... And Johnny Glogan, so it was, we were like the three amigos, these three uh, eccentric maverick outlaws, you know, in, uh, we would meet in Newman Laboratory Nuclear Studies, which is where Hans Bader and all these guys had their offices. All right, so, you know, what's going on here? Okay, let's, let's see, what, what's the big picture of the reality? The reality is that the universe is not what everybody thinks it is. Okay, it's, it's not what, even what Avi Loeb and these guys think it is. It's not what the Pentagon and this new committee and these, that NASA appointed, it's not what any of these guys, they're totally clueless as to what's really happening. So the whole thing's like a big joke is these guys are not gonna discover anything because they don't even know how to think about what's going on. Okay, we're not alone in the universe. This is my, this is what I'm saying. This is the narrative I'm trying to project onto the world. Okay. okay. As the messenger. Okay. Now you could say Jack is crazy. Well, of course, I'm not the only one saying this. So, you know, even Christopher Mellon is basically saying, Louis Elizondo basically saying the same thing. And especially Jim 
Semivan from the Central Intelligence Agency. You know, he has, he, he's saying it. Has, uh, <clears throat> so a lot of, you know, Jacques Vallée has basically said it. Well, well we, you know, Jack, you, you, I, I, the, the read that I get, right, from everyone that I've talked to, all walks of life, professional or not, it, yeah. I think right now everyone feels like something is going on, right? Yeah, now, something is going on. Exactly. But I, what I'm claiming is I know exactly what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And the reason I'm coming from two things. I'm coming from my own high strangeness experiences. That is my own contact with this extraterrestrial or time traveling conscious artificial intelligence, which I think is probably controlling the Tic Tacs. You know, most of you have those. Uh, and so from my direct contact, in 1953, where they correctly predicted things that were going to happen like 20 years in the future when I actually met Hal Putoff and Russell Targ and Andre Baharich and Uri Geller and Edgar Mitchell, Brendan O'Regan, you know, a lot of the key players, who some of them still around, though we're getting pretty old right now, correctly predicted I'd meet these people. And it said, they said they were going to teach me the physics. Okay, so now it sounds like a real nut. I'm channeling, you know, this, this real nut Sarvati. Every, all these equations you're writing down with some errors, they're being dictated to me by this very intelligence. And I'm not, they said, you know, other people may be getting the transmissions also. So this sounds, you know, up until uh, December, 2017, this would have sounded totally crazy. You know, get the get Nurse Ratchet to come, give Jack his his meds. You know, as some, as a lot of people say today, or they'll just say Jack is a he's a malignant narcissist. He's crazy. He's delusional. Okay, there's all this kind of attached, and I understand that. We can understand that because if what I'm saying is true, it scares it scares the people, especially scares the people in power because they realize they're no longer in control. They're not really in control. Okay. You know, you know, one of the things that I really like is when you talk about machine intelligence, and it, it's just because of my background. But also, when you look, I mean, you look at flight characteristics, you look at, at the dangers of traveling in space, all of these different aspects of it. Yeah. It's far more likely that we're going to see machine intelligence piloting UAPs or okay. controlling them than some kind of little gray man. That's that's okay. just my belief. But okay, no wait now. Some of that I agree with, but some of it is you're missing the point, but okay. I understand why, okay. okay? You're talking about the von Neumann probe theory. You yeah, know, the, the, yeah. And there's yeah. a lot of papers written about that. That's the, that's the kind of picture that Kevin Knuth is projecting, that Ivy Loeb of Harvard, they're all projecting. That's, they're basically thinking of conventional propulsion and which you would definitely need if it's, if it's conventional propulsion, which takes you know years, God knows how long, you know, uh, then everything you're saying is absolutely true. I mean, that'd be, but warp drive, metric engineering, warp drive and wormhole technology is a whole different ball game mm, okay. where we no longer need artificial intelligence. However, the fact of the matter is that I was actually contacted by an artificial intelligence that said it was a conscious artificial intelligence okay so both the or you know it's not one or the other it could be both and then you know if you think of it this way uh say there are these advanced whoever has been uh whoever's behind the tic tacs and the whole ufo thing okay uh in the uh, you know like millions of years ago they were like us they didn't have the the wormhole technology so they may have sent out the probes yeah, but it would have taken thousands of years, or whatever, to get here. Since they did that, they've also developed wormhole, you know, metric engineering, warp drive. So, so both mechanisms are there. It's not one or the other; it could be both. All right, now, um, but let me get back to the, the uh, Cornell University Laboratory of uh, Nuclear Studies, where it's Lenny Susskind, Johnny Goldgauer, and Jack Sarfati. So at that point, if you believe like Dean Radin's book, you know, Entangled Minds, uh, Russell Targ, same thing, my mind got quantum, well, I'll say post-quantum entangled with Lenny Susskind's mind. 
back in 1963. Okay. Then 10 years later, uh, I'm involved with all this strange stuff that's in how the hippie say physics, Central Intelligence Agency, all that stuff. Well, I go to Stanford Research Institute under very strange circumstances and meet Edgar Mitchell and Hal put off Russ Tog and they, they want me to do a mission for them in London to help arrange tests of Uri Geller at the University of London, all that stuff that's in the book. You know, it's pretty weird what was happening then. And uh, so there's all that strange stuff and uh, which is exactly on cue because the conscious artificial intelligence in 1953 said I was gonna to begin to meet the others in 20 years, which was 1973. So yeah, yeah, that's time travel. That's time travel, okay? Uh, there's no other way to explain it because nobody in the CIA or the army in 1953 where they were pretty naive and pretty simplistic could have predicted you know, what's gonna happen at SRI in 1973. This is, a, you know, what I'm saying is that I'm reporting uh, witness testimony, like in a crime investigation okay. Of, okay. Of, uh, of, of, of evidence, okay? And I'm claiming the only way to understand it is that uh, it's time travel. Yeah. And we're in contact with, okay. And then, like around uh, this Christmas in 1975, this guy, George Koopman, who's an intelligence agent, uh, says to, uh, he's funding us at Esalen, you know, uh, and he's saying, uh, he said, Jack, there are two things the CIA wants to know. One, how does consciousness work? Two, how do flying saucers fly? And he was being really explicit. He was paying us. And this is money from the Army Tank Command and the United States Air Force. Okay. This is also money we were getting indirectly through Lawrence Rockefeller. You know, he's involved in UFO and this, this whole thing. And then, of course, we have Dennis Bardens back in Cambridge in 1974. I'm at a meeting of the uh, Cambridge Psychological uh, Paranormal Research uh, Group uh, run by Ted Baston. And there I meet Brian Josephson, the Nobel Prize guy, as well as Bernard Carr, who was Stephen Hawking's assistant. I'm taken there by CIA agents. There's a whole thing, you know, it's a lot of paranormal stuff. And at the end of the meeting, this guy, Dennis Bardens, you look him up on the internet, he's basically MI6 type, you know, character. And uh, he said, he takes me to dinner at the Blue War Inn, Cambridge, and he says, Dr. Sarfati, it is my duty to inform you of a psychic war raging across the continents between the Soviet Union and your country, and you are in the thick of it, okay? <laughs> All right, yeah, awesome. so, so there's a lot of, yeah, there's a lot of strange stuff going. Okay, so, but in any case, we write the book, Fred Allen Wolf, Bob Tobin, Jack Sarfati are in Paris in 1974 at the Cafe du Magot. Uh, Bob uh, Tobin has a lot of money. He's funding this thing. And we're sitting around writing this crazy cartoon book called Space Time and Beyond. Okay. And if you read the first edition, Space Time and Beyond, I have ER equals EPR. I mean, it's very clearly. I, I, uh, yeah, I'm talking about quantum entanglement in the sense of Bohm, uh, quoting David Bohm's book, on, books on undivided, uh, well, quantum entanglement and wormholes, Wheeler's geometric dynamics on wormholes. I've been working, you know, under the influence of Wheeler. And I say somehow these two are complement, they have to be connected with each other. Yeah. I didn't know exactly how. So the basic idea of ER equals EPR is already printed in the first, in the Dutton edition, only in the first edition. It was taken out of the later editions. And that's because of other things, Ira Einhorn and the murder of Holly Maddox, and all kinds of cloak and dagger stuff going on in the background here. Yeah, you know, I'm in the thick of it, as Dennis Barn said. And um, so the point is now in hindsight, because Lenny Susskind's coming up with ER equal EPR, like, you know, uh, Maybe 20 years ago, we started doing it. And also, in Space Time Beyond, I have EPR signaling, you know, explaining telepathy and PK, all the paranormal stuff, as well as ordinary consciousness. I have EPR signaling is equal to traversable 
like time machines, you know, traversable Stargate type wormholes. When Lenny in his original papers, I guess they're like 20 years old, now maybe 15, I'm not sure. Uh, when he introduced the world hologram hypothesis, conjecture, um, he has ER equal EPR, but it's orthodox quantum theory of the EPR, you can't use it to directly signal. You mm -hmm. can encode messages, but you need a classical signal key to unlock the non-locally stored uh, information or message, okay? And then his wormholes are the ordinary wormholes that pinch off, so you can't get through the wormhole. Okay. It's only, okay. okay. It's only in the last year or two that Lenny has now extended his idea where he's now caught up with what I had already in 1975 in Space Time Beyond. And there are a lot of other people now that are all talking about traversable wormholes, but they don't emphasize the EPR signaling part. They're a little bit afraid of that. Well, and if I could ask, the, the yeah. reason that I asked that about the connection between the two is, so in my own history, I was working on an interview with Arthur C. Clarke in the 2000s, and yeah. it was related to a book that he wrote with Stephen Baxter. It was called The Light of Other Days. And yeah. in that, so in that book, they talked about basically a nano wormhole that was just big enough yeah. to transmit a few photons, and they yeah. wanted to use that for signaling. And so one yeah. of the things that I was working on with Clark was, let's let's talk about some of the physics ideas. Unfortunately, we weren't able to do it. He, he had been sick as a child, and that came back to him at the end. Yeah. And so, but, um, but so I've always been left with this question of how do you determine where the end point of a wormhole might be, you know? Okay, let me say first, let me say that this is very interesting because I spent time with Arthur C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke was at the tests of Uri Geller at mm. Birkbeck College, which I arranged because of my, at the request of Brendan O'Regan and Harold Putoff and these people, Edgar Mitchell from Stanford Research Institute. Okay. And, and Arthur C. Clarke, now I don't, I forget whether we just, we, we may have discussed some of this back then, you know, cause I was, it was Arthur C. Clarke and Arthur Kessler who wrote Doctors at Noon, you know, the, and it was also uh, Arthur Clarke, Arthur Kessler, and John Hastead, David Bohm, uh, Brendan O'Regan from SRI. Uh, and also we had a couple of, we, we actually had, uh, we, we, there was a party we had at John Hastead's house on the River Thames. Then there was another party at Arthur Kessler's house at one Montpellier Square near Knightsbridge. I remember very well. But, so we were talking about all kinds of crazy stuff back then. And I, I don't remember offhand whether we explicitly discussed, yeah, but we definitely talked about entanglement. And I was heavy into geometrodynamics. So that whole idea may have been discussed then because it was only about, it was around the same time as we were writing Space, Time and Beyond. Okay. okay. So there's a direct connection there with Arthur Kessler, okay? And I'm not Arthur, I mean Arthur C. Clarke and Arthur Kessler, you know. Um, so, um, so, okay. But the, what I wanted to say, the point I really want to make also is that it looks as though I was having a precognition back in 1974 when I'm with Kessler and, and, and Clark and Geller and um, you know all these people, David Bohm, John Hastead. It's like I'm maybe ha having what Russell Tog at the SRI calls precognitive remote viewing because my mind's already kind of entangled, okay, with Lenny's. And I'm kind of like dimly through, you know, through the glass darkly seeing what Lenny's going to do in the future, in what, almost 40 years in the future, okay? At least there's a correlation, it's a very, or you could say there's an entanglement across time. See, you have to do this, it's across time. And what these guys in the Pentagon, what Christopher Mellon, Louis Elizondo, you know, well, Jacques Vallée should know better, because I was involved with Jacques back then, is that I have a perspective of now over 60 years, but about 70 years, right? Yeah. 53. So I have a 70 year perspective. And of course, I'm you know, reevaluating the data all the time. You know, it's, uh, in fact, what, what, we, what the human mind does exactly the same thing that artificial intelligence does. There's like a landscape of, you know, it's, it's integrating 
it's it's like a little ball running across the landscape and it seeks the most stable minimum in like its potential energy surface. And that's also called Bayesian inference. I mean, what do we have? I'm dealing with a lot of information. My personal experiences, these weird high strangeness, paranormal stuff I've been having all my life, right? And I'm not the only one. You know, Russell Tog, Hal Putoff, Jim Simivan, they're all having these, these strange things. So I'm taking all of that and plus the physics information I have, and I'm trying to make a coherent narrative that I can communicate to ordinary people to let them know what's happening. All right, now we're also we're on the brink of destruction. We're on the eve of the apocalypse, right? We have the war in Ukraine. Uh, we have, unfortunately, we've been supplying uh, weapons and intelligence to Zelensky in Ukraine, which is just prolonging the the, uh, the people getting killed on both sides. Yeah, it's you know it's it's worrisome. I, I've seen more serious discussions of Putin and, and the potential for nuclear war in the last exactly, two, two we're weeks. Pushing, we're, we're pushing, we're pushing, the more we deplete, the more we deplete Putin's ammunition, etc. the more Ukraine has temporary tactical victories on the battlefield, the more likely it is for Putin in his desperation to go nuclear. Yeah. And that's yeah. not anybody's benefit no. okay now it's not just you know noam chomsky a leading leftist marxist intellectual at mit noam chomsky the darling of the leftist progressive intellectuals henry kissinger the right wing you know according to the various the right wing fascists and the pope they all say what i'm saying they all say this is very you know this is not a this is not a wise a wise policy yeah um so, okay, we're on the brink of nuclear destruction. Anything can happen. We're very close. I mean, this is, this is now much more dangerous than uh, 1963, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I remember very well. It was up at Cornell and Ithaca you know, when that was happening. And so we have a perfect storm developing here. On the one hand, we have you know, the war in Ukraine. We're on the brink of nuclear de destruction. We have the Pentagon now releasing official information. All this stuff is real. UFOs are real. So the and, things and, and NASA, NASA as well. NASA and is NASA, involved they're too. All, okay. It's no longer just you know crazy Jack and other crazies. You know. Uh, so, but but look at the look at the big picture. It's like a perfect storm. And then, if the technology I'm talking about explains what's real. This is also a weapons technology. Um, there's a guy, Robert Adnell, which uh, did you have him on? Uh, he was on uh, Bob Adnell. Uh, he was on the Jim Breslow show. He's a smart guy. You should actually interview him. He's up in Canada. He's a Canadian military historian. He okay. teaches at, at the, like at the West Point of Canada and stuff like that. I, I think I've talked to him a few times, but you may have talked to him a few times. And he has also he sees the weapons potential of all this stuff um all right so so there there we are that um yeah i'm trying to explain now that we're in a new reality we're not alone in the universe time travel is real we have these advanced intelligences who can probably prevent the nuclear war we don't know but yeah you know, there's all this even this christopher mount's not just you know, it's my my loyal, my disloyal opposition. We all agree about this. Um, and the people now, NASA just said that this board, you know, this NASA board for the UAPs, they're nice guys, but they're, they're clueless. They're not gonna, they, yeah, they need me there. <laughs> you know, to talk about the physics so they give them the big, but they're not gonna come up with anything because, you know, they're, they're, they're bureaucrats. They're, Maybe great in their certain fields and their specialties, but they don't have the physical, the physics understanding of how to even approach to even understand what they're seeing. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's like the uh, it's like the cargo cult. You know, this um, 
the natives in Polynesia, World War II, they would see you know the American airplanes landing all the stuff, and they and they couldn't understand it, so they made like a cargo cult uh, imitation of what they were seeing. And that's exactly what our people in, in the Pentagon and the CIA what they're doing now. They, 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 you know they, they they're like it, they're like the apes before the monolith at the opening of Space Odyssey. Probably the Russians are no better. Yeah, it may be true. The Russians may not be as smart either. I thought maybe they were. Probably not. The Chinese, I'm not so sure about. <laughs> the Chinese may. And then, of, and of course, we also have now the, the Chairman Xi. Now he's the absolute, he's the new Mao Zedong. He's the absolute dictator. They got rid of you know, the guy before him. They pulled him out right next to him. So he's now the total despot in China. And uh, he can attack Taiwan at any time now. We can't f fight a, a two front war. Yeah. Um, yeah. All right. So we're in very dangerous times. I'll stop here and let, let you uh, redirect now. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I think that was probably my, my primary question was about wormholes and entanglement. And again, in the light of other days, it opened up a lot of new possibilities. They were saying you could, in theory, you could transmit, you could transmit information, you know, potentially yeah. if you if you use more power, you could actually transmit, for instance, um, what if you put one end of the wormhole in the sun and you put the other end in a reactor, right? You could power yeah. a nuclear reactor. So there yeah. are a lot of these these pie in the sky ideas that Baxter and Clark envisioned. And and then the, the hey, the when big, did they write that? When when was that story written? I think they wrote it. In, I think it came out in two thousand. I believe it came out in two thousand. Okay, so okay, Clark had already. I'm pretty sure Clark read Space Time and Beyond. Oh so yeah, I, and plus I had conversations with Clark. So Clark, I may have directly influenced his thinking about you, that. You and him, I think, I think you and him are very much or on the same wavelength, right? Yeah. The monolith yeah. itself. But we actually so, had conversations, you know, with, back at, at, in London in 1974, on and, at least three occasions, on three occasions, both at Birkbeck itself. Actually, I think there were maybe two or three meetings at Birkbeck at, at John Hastead's house and also at Arthur Kessler's house. Yeah. Talking, and, kinds of stuff. Clark was, he was a firm optimist about yeah. human ingenuity. Also, I remember he had a quote about anti-gravity from the 50s. I actually have it on my yeah, hard right. drive somewhere. And he'd said, right. anything that mankind wants bad enough, it usually gets. Yeah, of course. And the anti-gravity yeah. problem is rather simple. I'm claiming now the anti-gravity problem is simple. Okay, so why don't you repeat what you were saying about Clark and anti-gravity? You, you were... Well, so again, this was in the 1950s, and Arthur C. Clarke had a movie quote. Someone had asked him specifically about anti-gravity because that was in vogue back in the 50s, right? Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. his quote was, anything that mankind wants badly enough, it usually gets, you know? And so I, I would say he was a firm optimist about human ingenuity. I think that's a good thing. Yes. Okay. Now, here's the thing. The CIA... Uh, and others from the Defense Department asked me over 50 years ago to try to solve the anti-gravity problem along with the consciousness problem. Now, I claim that, I, that I've solved it and using standard physics, uh, using, uh, okay, anti-gravity, and this would be synonymous with the warp drive, right? Yes, yes, same thing. Same, same technology, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it is, uh, it's called metric engineering. Engineering. I like to write in real time because it slows things down so people can kind of see, you know, because so, I tend to go to that metric engineering, that's how put off coined. Well, and I think it's incredibly valuable. So thank you so much for sharing this with us. Yeah, yeah. Metric engineering. Okay, so, but the problem to do with, problem is too much energy. Too much energy, they think, okay, because we have Einstein, Einstein, 1916, 
field equations, G mu nu, I'll call it capital K, T. This is, this is basically general relativity. This is, this is gravity. And this is the, uh, so we call it, let's just, I'll just call it energy now. So it's a little more common, I'll just call it the energy. So this, this you're describing, when you say too much energy, you're talking about the Alcubier drive, right? The standard idea of the Alcubier drive. Yeah, well, the reason, the reason, when I say too much energy, the reason is that K is too small. So we'll do, let's, let's go on. Okay, K is too, too small. And so let, let me, let me, okay, let me do it again. So it's G mu nu is equal to K T mu nu. So it's just, it's just algebra. This is just simple algebra. If K is very small, as if K is small, then in order to get a fixed amount of gravity on the left-hand side equation, as K gets smaller for a fixed amount of gravity that you want here to cancel, say, the Earth's gravity field, you need TUV, the energy, to be bigger. Yeah. Okay? So what we want to do, what we're seeing, the flying saucers, You know, the five observables. Is there a way of getting that up on, uh, you know, the five observables, which you've talked about, right? Yeah, That's we've the, talked about that. Unfortunately, I don't have the slides queued up for it. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, maybe when you edit this thing, you stick a slide in there, Lily Alzando. Um, okay. Um, they require, you need K very big, K very big. Okay, so because of the evidence, because of the five observables, which is a summary of all the UFO evidence, you know, instant, in, uh, uh, but apparently enormously high accelerations, etc. Uh, that means warp drive, because in warp drive, in warp drive. High g acceleration is is an illusion. It's an optical illusion. The real acceleration inside the flying saucer is zero. So let's do a flying saucer. <laughs> oh, so the g is zero inside. But to the guy outside, it looks like G is like, uh, say, 5,000 Earth G. Earth. Yeah, and that's because it's Earth. falling into the gravity well, right? Yeah, yeah. It's a big, well, yeah. Um, and like, if you, your, your interview with Kevin Knuth, this is what he would say, you know, your video that you did with him. So, yeah. So the thing is this. The reason for that is in gravity, we have what are called geodesics. On a geodesic, it's zero G, zero G force. But to, an, to a guy out here, to an observer out here, using light signals, observing this thing with light signals, it'll look like, it'll look like G is uh, say uh, 5,000 or more, whatever it is, Earth G. See, so that's just, a, that's just an, an illusion because what's happening, the UFO is controlling its local gravitational field. It, in other words, the UFO, UFO, controls its geodesic. It's 
it, it cancels the Earth's field, cancels Earth's field. Okay, so that's, so that's what we said. And now that's not just me. I, I said it, and then there's another guy, but we got his name, he disappeared. Thoth, whatever his name is. You know, do you remember? Do you know what his real name is? No, no, I don't. Oh, but you know who I'm talking about? Yeah. This guy, yeah, this guy, he got paranoid. Something happened, he disappeared. But he had basically, he said, he was saying what I'm saying independently. He didn't know what I was saying. Oh, about. yes, I, I know you, you're talking about Thor. And he was Thor. with the, yeah, he was with the, uh, the SCU, right? Society for. Well, whatever. Okay. So he, name, yeah. so he, he empirically comes up with the same idea I'm talking about, but he doesn't understand how to achieve it. Okay. So now the, so the question is, let's get back to, so it's G mu nu equals K T mu mu. How to control K to make it big, to make it big. Okay, that's the problem. That's the technology, that's the metric engineering problem. Metric engineering. Engineering problem, okay? How, how do you make it big? Now, hey, by the way, we want to make it big, but we also want to flip its sign. Now look, listen to this. So let me write it this way. Let me write it this way. Uh, normally, for normal, it's G. Well, no, wait just a minute. There are two things we've got to do with K. This is G mu nu is K T mu nu when K is positive. When K is a positive number. This is attractive gravity. Gravity. Okay. And that's like, for example, if this is um, if this is the if this is the this is uh if this is the uh, what's called the uh, the gra potential energy energy. Uh, I can't spell energy of gra of gravity. If the gravity takes over, if you start here and you move up to there, so you have to do work. And this is what's called you get. This is a gravity redshift. Which Einstein? This is one of one of Einstein's Einstein's uh, prediction. Diction, 1916. That that, for example, if you had uh, light from a from an atom in the sun coming to the Earth from a certain spectral line, we know what the we know what in the lab in the laboratory on Earth. If we have say a hydrogen atom and it emits a photon, it has a certain frequency. We could see that same kind of atom in the sun and the light from the sun. There's a a shift in that frequency, that photon has a lower frequency. We call that a red shift because of, because of climbing out of the attractive gravitational field. So mm. that's gravity red shift. So that's when K in this convention is positive. But if K were negative, if we could flip somehow, uh, if we had, we had G mu nu, equal k t mu when now k is negative that's our that's repulsive repulsive anti-gravity and there we have um there what we have we have a, the potential this is now the potential energy And that would be your, your force beam, right? Yeah, well, here, you start from here. Now the ball is rolling down the hill. It's picking up energy. But energy is H nu, you know, Planck's law, right? So here, this is a blue shift. 
This is the blue shift. This is the anti-gravity blue shift. When K is negative, we could flip K. So we have to have, so, okay, you see that? So it's just the opposite, it's like the time reverse. It's like the difference between a black hole and sort of sort of like a white hole, although that's tricky too. All right, so so we have two problems. So we have let me go back to uh, we have uh, g mu nu is k t mu nu. Now the standard the standard thing k in nineteen sixteen gr k is equal to eight pi capital G over C to the fourth. This is Einstein because he needed this, he needed this to get agreement for GR to agree with uh, Newton's gravity, with Newton, Newton's equations, okay? Where C, C is the speed of light of light, oops, light, in vacuum. In vacuum, it's gotta be, it's very important it's in vacuum, it can't be in, in material. And G is, uh, G is just Newton's, Newton's constant, N Newton's constant. You know, just go to Wikipedia, the people who don't know, all this stuff is at Wikipedia. Now, the idea is, and I'm speaking very loosely now, we want make C small inside, uh, and I'm going to say, in, I'll go write a uh, metamaterial. Because since it goes as one over C to the fourth, as C goes to zero, this goes to infinity, gets very big. That's the basic idea, you know, mathematically. It's just the math idea. Now there, you know, there are problems. Now, now can I ask, have you identified yeah. any candidate metamaterials? Pardon, pardon me? Oh, have you identified any candidate metamaterials, any kind of materials that, that people, uh, that scientists are interested in? Well, uh, you say, if you're saying, do I have a design for metamaterial that'll do this? No, I don't, not yet. Okay. But I don't know how to do that uh, because I'm not that kind of a physicist. You know, that's, that, 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 that's the Manhattan Project. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Okay, that's the Manhattan Project. Level well, and, and the reason I ask is metamaterials are used for many things, right? They're, they're used like it for microwave frequencies. I think that's that's currently what's being yeah. Explored. Now there's another, see now there's another problem here. Now that's getting to there's another problem. There's a big problem here. There's a big problem here. Uh, matter what's called dispersion. Hmm. That is C speed of light in, in matter depends on the frequency. Okay. But in Einstein's equation in G mu nu equals eight pi G over C to the fourth. C cannot depend on frequency. Or well, if it does, you got then then you're in trouble. In despair, this equation kind of breaks down because what does it mean? Because see, this equation is supposed to be true in general. It's what's called the tensor equation. And when inside matter, uh, this whole idea breaks down. And and now uh, now normally, we know for electromagnetic waves going through materials, we have what's called the index of refraction. Of refraction. 
Okay, where C, C in, in matter is the C in vacuum divided by, by N, by the index of refraction. But see, this can depend on frequency. I'll call it frequency omega. So this depends on frequency. And then you have a problem because this equation has to look the same no matter who is looking at it. What's called, this is the idea of coordinate uh, covariance, what's called, mm -hmm. it gets pretty technical. But the point is this equation has to look the same no matter who looks at it. Now I gotta be a little careful when I say that. When I say who's looking at it, what we mean is we have different observers in vacuum, okay, moving relative to each other in vacuum, it's gotta be in vacuum, looking at say the flying saucer flying around, but they're looking at it with lights, with, with uh, well, it doesn't have to be like microwaves, or infrared, gamma rays, but they're looking at it with electromagnetic signals that, that are moving through the vacuum. See that people, this is very important. Otherwise, that's what relativity theory is all about. Um, so we have right away, we have a problem. See, here's the thing now. So the problem is that first of all, what C squared, let me write this. This is Maxwell. Maxwell's uh, 1865. Uh, and E0 is uh, what's called the electric permittivity. And mu0 is the magnetic permeability. So this was 18, this civil war, 1865, the first unified, unified field theory, theory of light, C, electricity, city, epsilon zero, and magnetism. Oops, magnet. U zero. Now, um, okay, so now we have this. So, and this is for the vacuum. So what is epsilon zero? Epsilon zero in vacuum. In vacuum, now we didn't, now Maxwell didn't know this, and Einstein didn't know this in, 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 uh, in uh, Maxwell in, in 1865 did not know what I'm about to say, and neither did Einstein in 1916 when he did GR. But today, when what's called quantum electrodynamics, you know, Feynman, those guys, what the vacuum is, is uh, um, over, it's, you know, basically, it's you know, what I call virtual, virtual electron, positron, pairs and E0, zero, zero, E0, zero, zero has to do with the separation. I'll call it an E plus, these are virtual part of E minus and the separation D. So E0 is kind of like the charge times D. The charge separates like an electric dipole. It's like, it's like an electric dipole, trick dipole. It's called vacuum polarization. Polarization. And what is what is what is mu zero? Mu zero is because these little things are, are moving around. They they're in motion, so it's like a like a little magnetic dipole. Okay. So we now have a we now have a microscopic a quantum mechanical a quantum field picture of why what these quantities are. Okay. And now they also the physicists also say well they say 
C is, is, is C is a universal constant. So there's a fillet of a wrong a, a wrong argument. Wrong argument by the proof bars. Proof bars. That it has to be G over C to the fourth vacuum. That has to be K <clears throat> that this is <clears throat> this is edict from God. <laughs> from God. If you question this, you are a heretic and a crackpot. <laughs> this is <laughs> because they say C has to be constant. Well, number one, C doesn't have to be constant because we now know from quantum electrodynamics that the value of the vacuum speed of light is a contingent empirical property depending on the detailed internal structure of the electron positron pairs and other fields inside the vacuum. And that we now know there are things called vacuum phase transitions you have different vacuums. In fact, that's what inflation is all about. You know, the Big Bang, inflation, moment of inflation. There's a vacuum phase transition, which the structure of the quantum vacuum changes and releases all this energy, causing uh, our observable universe. That's roughly the idea. And then when they say it's a universal constant, they also get very confused. And I'm talking about physics professors now, people who, you know, who should know better. Even Nobel Prize physicists, they don't, because they, they don't really think about this. They, they, they just kind of like forget, yeah. they, they, don't, they don't ask the questions. It's accepted and, wisdom. I think that's what you're saying. Yeah, it's a, it's a, yeah the consensus, the group, it's group think, group think. Group think. Okay, here's the point. Now they confuse C being constant, meaning that, that the vacuum speed of light must be the same everywhere in the whole universe. Okay, now that may or may not be true, but that's an empirical problem. That's a problem of ob observation. There's no a priori theoretical reason why that has to be true, given now what we know about quantum electrodynamics, which Einstein did not know back in 1916. So it's okay for him to think that way. But there's also, they confuse, they confuse the constancy constancy of C, of C vacuum, with invariance, with, um, with frame invariance. See, here's the thing, when you write down, here's the point, G mu nu, I'm going to K, T, you know. K has to be invariant in, in, this is now the mathematics of relativity. K has to be what's called invariant. That is same number, same, That's the same number for Alice and Bob. Let's say Alice and Bob. Okay, what do I mean by that? What I mean by that? I mean by that is Alice is Alice is moving through is on this kind of path. Bob is on this kind of path. And here we have our, our tic-tac. And they're, they're both looking, they're both using EM signals. And over here, there's, there's like a warp field. There's a G mu nu warp field 
okay? And inside the Tic Tac, there's a little T mu nu, which is generating the warp field, okay? But it's using these light, it's that, a, a, Bob will say G mu nu of Tic Tac, Bob's detectors is equal to K T mu nu of Tic Tac, Bob, okay? And then we're gonna have, I'll call it G prime, mu prime, V prime, Tic Tac, Alice is gonna be equal to K T mu nu uh, Tic Tac, Alice. Okay, now these, this G mu nu does not have to be exactly the same as this G prime G mu nu, same for T, but the Ks have to be exactly the same number. That's called an invariant. These things are called covariant. They have to, there's a certain relationship between them. But you see what it is, it's that what these equations mean, they're talking about the objective physical conditions at the Tic Tac, but as seen through signals delayed in time, as, as signals to, as seen by detectors of external observers using electromagnetic wave signals through the vacuum, it's gotta be through the vacuum. If there was material here that was dispersive, then things would get screwed up. You could still do it, but it would be very complicated, probably be practically almost very hard to actually, actually do the observations. So uh, you know, out in space, it's pretty good. And in the, even looking at these Tic Tacs through the atmosphere, there is some dispersion, depends what kinds of signals they use. You want to use signals in which the frequency and the speed of light doesn't change very much with frequency. So there are all kinds of you know, technical problems in doing this. But this is the meaning of general relativity, OK? So, okay, so now, here's the problem. Here's the problem. So if we use g mu nu is equal to 8 pi g over c to the 4 um, t mu nu. Now, in, in what's called special relativity, 1905, we have what are called inertial, inertial frame transformations. Also called Lorentz transformations. Transforms. Okay. C vacuum. Is invariant. C vacuum is invariant for these in special relativity, and we all, they also assume that that Newton's g is all. That's the sum assuming that's invariant. So so if for inertial frames this equation works, works for in special. You can write this equation just in special relativity. There are tenses in special relativity. The equation works in special relativity. 1905, you can still write this equation, although, well, there's the problem. It works there, but it doesn't work. It doesn't work for what are called non-inertial frame transformations. See, then what is it? Okay, what inertial frame transformations means that Alice and Bob, Alice and Bob, they're each moving on geodesics. They're each moving weightless zero G force. And they're using light signals, electromagnetic signals to look at what they're, what they're measuring at a remote, you know, they're measuring it. It's remote sensing, you know, in military language, these are remote sensing. All the measurements in Einstein's relativity theory are remote sensing measurements. They're not measurements by little, little nano observers inside materials. That's a whole a new ball game, okay? 
So it's invariant for, for, for inertial observers. But now, suppose Alice and Bob are accelerating. Suppose they're in rocket ships, this is all out in space, right? and they start firing their rockets, so they're accelerating. Okay, so it turns out if Alice and Bob, Bob accelerate, accelerate, sorry, my handwriting, C is not, not, not invariant. So the theory, so G mu nu equals eight pi G C to the fourth breaks down. Breaks down because this is K, that this coupling is no longer invariant under these more general frame transformations for accelerating for like a rotating frame. Okay, so this is the problem. So this, this problem has not been noticed even by Kip Thorne, any of these guys until I brought it up. Why, okay. What they do, what, if you go to textbooks, they set C equal to one. Sometimes they said G equal to one in the text. So they write down G mu nu is T mu nu in a system of units. So they just forget about it. It's just that they said everything was the one. They don't even ask about that. Because they think it's not gonna change anyway. And they don't think you can make it big anyway. And there was no reason for them. There's no reason for Kip Thorne or, or John Wheeler or, or any of Meisner, or any of these guys, Cliff Will, no reason for them to worry about this because they didn't believe in UFOs. They had no motivation. You see, physics is an empirical observational subject. It's because the Central Intelligence Agency comes to Jack Sarfati and a few other of us and says, we want you to work on UFOs 50 years ago that we started thinking along these lines. I mean, Kip Thorne and these guys, they would deny Martin Rees, Astronomer Royal, you know, yeah, they would deny that this is a, that this is real evidence. Some saying, well, suppose it is real evidence. Then, then what I'm saying has to be the case. There's no no getting around it. No getting around. It. So what do I do? What do I do? I say that the real equation has to be, especially in, um, the real equation is it's g mu nu is equal to eight pi g c to the four. And I put a new field in the Sarfati field. <laughs> you know, there's an S times T mu nu. Okay. S is what's called the compensating field. The compensating field. It has to, it's sort of like the theory of gauge, gauge, gauge fields. It's kind of maybe like, sort of like a gauge field. I'll put a question mark. I'm, that's an analogy, um, analogy. So, I mean, okay, now C, one over C to the four, invariant in, in, in uh, SR for inertial frames, that's okay. So S is also invariant separately for inertial frames. And also S, S equals one in vacuum, only in inertial frame, not in an inertial. But of course, uh, in vacuum, this equation is irrelevant because this is zero. See, I just, I'm, it's, it's it's true, but it doesn't matter. But S is not equal to one inside a metamaterial. So it could be, we don't know what it's going to be. That's that you know, we have to figure that out, what it's going to be. But here's the point. So what happens in a in an in non-inertial, non-inertial inertial frame 
transformations. We can have C, I can have C goes to C prime, not equal to C. S goes to S prime, not equal to S, but in such a way that S over C to the fourth equals S prime or C prime to the fourth. That's the idea. That's a, so that K, K, K is equal to K prime in G mu nu equals equals uh, equals k t mu nu and also that's also the same as g prime mu prime v prime equals the same k t prime mu prime v prime this is for alice and this is for bob hmm. okay so that's the idea all right so the problem is how do we compute okay so Look at this. So the problem is how to compute S. Well, you have to know, okay, that's the problem. That's the big problem. So that's the problem we're working on. I don't think I haven't solved that problem yet. But what we know is that who's ever flying those, whoever designed those tic tacs, they have solved the problem. Yeah. See, that's what this is empirical. It's like a mystery. And it's the only way to understand the phenomenon. Okay. So now I, I now I don't want to get too much detail. Yeah, I have various guesses on, on how to solve the problem. But the basic thing is going to be this. Turns out that S, okay, here's the basic thing, what I'm, what I'm going to say. G mu nu will be of the form eight pi capital G, C to the fourth vacuum. Uh, I'm gonna write S like this, and I'm gonna write T mu nu like this, and I have a cosine of theta. Okay, now, this has to do with complex numbers. I don't know, in, in complex numbers, you have what's called the real part of Z, the imaginary part of Z, this is where z e to the i theta. So it turns out, S turns out to be what's called a complex field. And for electromagnetism, this electromagnetic energy term also has a complex part, okay? So that theta, theta is, uh, is the sum of the of the of what are called the complex the phases of the S field and the what is called the stress energy tensor field. It's complicated, okay. But the point is this: you see. Let me go back. Let me do it again. G mu nu is equal to eight pi g over c to the four. At what's called the amplitude of S, the amplitude of t mu nu, and cosine of theta. Theta technically, for those who know some math, is the arg of S plus the arg of phase. Arg means phase of uh, T mu nu. I'll call it, I should call it that actually. Okay. So the point is this, what does a cosine look like? Cosine function. If you go back to your trigonometry, this is uh, this will be theta, and this is pi over two. And this is pi, this is plus one, and this is minus one. So the point is this, if we can switch, if theta, if, if theta starts out at zero, which is attractive gravity, if we can switch it to, to, uh, to pi, if we could do a pi, what's called a pi phase shift, we've changed the sign. That gives us the anti-gravity that we need. See, see in the alcuberry, in the in alcuberry, 
you know, we have, uh, uh, so here's a tic tac. Tic tac. Here we have, um, here we have, here we have, I'm sorry. In the tic tac, we have, this is, this is the gravity part, gravity at the nose. And this is the, this is the anti-gravity, anti-grav, anti-gravity in the tail. And uh, this is a uh, gravity. In the nose, right? And this is for to, to the outside observer, to the um, to the uh, to this guy, to command a fire. Oh, no, damn it! Come on. To command a fire, commander fire. Or Ryan Graves. U.S. Navy pilots in the F-18s. It's like going this way. The Tic Tac seems to be going that way, right? Right? So now here's the thing. Normally, you know, we have what called the Doppler shift. Let's look at this for a second, all right? So normally, uh, emotional, now this is a prediction. This is how you can tell if things in warp drive. Easy test, easy, easy test for US Navy uh, F-18 pilots. They must have this on board, since on board. If a Tic Tac, if the Tic Tac is coming toward you, Tic Tac, If it's coming toward you, you're going to see a anomalous redshift counteracting the motional Doppler shift, which would be a blue shift, right? So you're going to see you're going to see something funny. You're going to see the blue shift, blue shift, shift. If the tic tacs come to you, if you're about to, if, it, if it's approaching you, the blue shift will be weaker. Because of this gravity redshift getting in the way, they, they conflict with each other. Okay. Oh, damn. And 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 just the opposite. So this is what's called the uh, the reverse reverse Doppler. You see these anomalous, anomalous frequency shifts in the signals coming from these flying saucers. If you see that, then you know the thing's in warp drive. It's not moving ordinarily through space. Okay, that's warp drive. Also, you're going to see uh, image distortions. You're going to see image distortion. Distortion. Like gravitational lensing. Yeah, the right. gravity lensing effect. Uh, shape shifting. Shifting. And multiple images. Multiple images. Yeah, I like think those, the, those were all yeah in the Agbadia video. That was the one. Yeah, that they, they report that. They see, they, sometimes they see like the thing splits apart. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's gravity lensing, okay? So these are very clear empirical tests that if there's warp drive, and by the way, I think what's his name, Thor, was it Thor? He said this too. He, you know, yeah, he had, yeah. Yeah, independently. So, so that's it. So, so the problem is how do you make K big and how do you flip the, the cosine phase? You need a pi phase shift to get, 
you know, in different parts of the fuselage, how to do that. I don't know how to do that yet because I'm working by myself, I'm 83 year old guy working alone, basically, you know, and uh, nobody, uh, very few people understand what, you know, what the, what the picture is. And then you have guys, I'm sorry, Chris Mellon saying, don't pay attention to Snarfati, you know, he's crazy. So that, 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 that's, that's not good either. So there we are on the, um, maybe that's enough for one session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. why don't we close, why don't we close for today, Jack? Let me thank yeah. you again so much for your time yeah. and for walking us through this. I, I genuinely, yeah. it is an honor to have you present this. And yeah, the, so, so we have to do a thing. Is, we have to do a thing on the on on the consciousness and the paranormal, but that should be a separate thing. This is, you know, this is difficult, pretty sophisticated stuff. So see if yeah. you want to use it. You know, decide. Okay. So, Wonderful, Jack. Thank okay. you again, sir, so much. Okay. Okay. Bye bye.